Good morning. Woo! Y'all are too happy. Way too happy. Welcome to the lake. If this is your first time with us, my name is Ronnie. I'm the Connections Pastor, the new Connections Pastor here. The old pastor that's new in a role here. It's just, but anyway, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Ronnie. I'm so glad that you're here on this weekend as we finish off. Uh, I get the opportunity to finish off this series, One Small Step. And it's, I, I know we keep calling them teaching series, but this, this for the past several weeks, this has not been a, really a teaching series, but it's been more of a journey. A journey together to, to challenge us to be strong and courageous and, and to live with the hope that we are chosen by God, that we are each chosen by God for his purpose. And then to be an example of Jesus at, at all times in our lives so people can see who God is through us. Now, as I've been part of this journey with you, I have this, this question that I wanted to ask you this morning. How, how hard is it? How hard is it, really, how hard is it to be strong and courageous and, and to live with the hope that God has chosen us for his purpose? And, and how hard is it to be an example of Jesus to the people around us in our home, the people that we associate with all the time? In, in the world that we live in, how hard is it to be strong and and courageous. I mean, sometimes, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's just me, sometimes it can be a battle to be strong and courageous and to live with the hope and, and to, to, be, to be an example, to be an example of Jesus in the world that we live in. I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be easier? Wouldn't it be safer just to quietly blend in you know, compromise just a little, just so we don't offend anybody with our beliefs. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be safer if we could do that and, and, and not offend anybody? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that, what would be the harm in that? Just a little. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you today... Uh, we're going to be looking at a strange passage of Scripture that you probably don't read on a regular basis. Haggai, uh, or Haggai is how I was told to say it. Haggai, hey Haggai, hey and you know, then so, uh, but we'll be there in a little bit. But in the Old Testament, this happened, this compromising and this being quiet happened quite a bit with the Israelites. You know, God's chosen people. God, God's people, and, and he did it so often that he eventually causes God to allow King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the Babylonians, to come in and cap, take captive, to conquer, destroy Israel, and take all of God's people captive. I mean, Jerusalem is destroyed. The, the temple is left in ruins, and God's chosen people, because they compromised a little at a time, a little at a time, one small step at a time, one small step at a time. They end up in captivity. And while in captivity, the Persians defeat the Babylonians. So now they're captives to Persia. But in their captivity, in those 70 years in captivity, King Cyrus, I mean, is that right? Make sure I get this right. Yeah, King Cyrus of Persia allows a remnant because they're, they're, they've heard about how bad Jerusalem is now. And how bad the temple and all that. And now the f people in Israel have heard about it, the captives, and they want to go back. So he allows 50,000. I understand 50,000 is just a remnant of what was taken. So 50,000 to go back. And they can rebuild the walls and they can rebuild the temple. And in Ezra, you can read through Ezra. It's a pretty short book, but you can read through Ezra. After two years of labor, the foundation for the temple was finally laid. It took them two years to lay the foundation. Now, I, I was in Zimbabwe back at, at the end of the year and in Christmas, and they sent pictures. We, went, we, we got to go see the foundations being laid for four churches. And it took, all that, it took forever for them to lay the foundation because they have to make the block. And they have to dry the block. Then they have to put it all together. Then a, a general contractor has to come make sure they put it right. Am I, am I correct? And it took how long just to lay the foundation? Months just to lay a foundation. Today, in 2024, it took months 
to lay the foundation. We're like, man, the foundation gets laid in a day. No, no. In two years, they laid his foundation, and he called this big celebration. So all the captain, the remnant come together there in Jerusalem at the temple foundation, and they had a big celebration. And the crazy part was half of the people, the younger generation that were there, they were celebrating because the foundation had been laid. And the older generation that remembered what the temple used to look like, cried at the same time. So they had cheers and they had tears of what was going on. And it was so loud that some people outside of Jerusalem heard it. And it says this in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. Now when the adversaries uh, of Judah and Benjamin, and the adversaries are enemies, they're the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, they're the, they're the enemies of Israel. When they heard all this commotion, and that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, who was the general contractor for the, the, the temple, and, and the heads of the father's houses, and said to them, let us build with you. This sounds so exciting. Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the day of Esarhaddon, God, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now, I don't know if it, when you read, like I said, I've done this before, but maybe you have a, a question. Actually, I have two questions. The first question is this. Why is it? That after three weeks of this teaching through one, uh, with one small step, each week we read the names of Joshua, Joseph, and Mary, and the Apostle Paul, and Timothy. And here in the final week, I get Zerubbabel <laughs> and Esther Hayden. Yeah. Matt, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> it just fell. I, 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 the lot fell on me. Anyway, oh, but really, the, the actual question that maybe you see there that I have, how is it possible that the enemies of Israel, literally the enemies of God, the enemies who worship pagan idols, how is it possible that the enemies of Israel can worship God the same way the Israelites do? How is it possible that the enemies of God offer sacrifices to the God that Israel worships? How is that possible? It's not. You got to understand what's being said here, what's being communicated here. What they're saying is, you know, we want to help you because you worship your God the same way we worship our God's. Are idols. When you want something, then you offer a sacrifice. You don't worship him in the good times. You only worship him when you want something. So we worship basically the same type of God. And we hear the same thing today. If you listen closely, people will say, oh, well, we're worshiping the same God. We're all worshiping the same God. We're just on different paths. We're going about it a different way. We, don't, we, we have different beliefs. We don't accept all of the Bible, just the parts that we agree with and that agree with us. We, we, we hear it all the time. People try to make this, you know, saying we're all, this, we're all worshiping the same God and we're on the same path. No, we're not. We're not all worshiping the same God. We're all, people are worshiping anything and everything, but they're not be worshiping the God that gave his son for us. So then in verse 3, but Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the rest of the heads of the father's houses, it's going to get harder, just wait. I mean, just, and the rest of the father's houses in Israel, they're offended by this comparison that these, these Assyrians just made, that they worship, the, no, 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 no. You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. You have, just get, leave us alone. We're going to build this our way, and you have nothing to do with it. Which upsets the Assyrian HOA and 
because you can only build if they say you can build, and now you're building, and we don't want so that they contacted the current king in Persia now. His name is Artaxerxes, again, <laughs> with X's in There's X's in his name. Anyway, they contact Artaxerxes, and he issues a decree, a proclamation, a work stoppage order on rebuilding the temple. And usually around here, when there's a work stoppage, you can get it, you know, taken care of with a, an inspector in about a week, and you can get started or started back. No, this work stoppage lasted 16 years. 16 years, you can't build the temple. King Artaxerxes has died, and now it's King Darius. He's the king of Persia. Can you imagine the Israelites? They, 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 they want to build it, but they can't. So after 16 years of being told you can't, what do you possibly do? Nothing. And if you have no temple to worship and you're not worshiping God any different than the pagans are worshiping their gods, then you're drifting further and further and further away from God and enter Haggai. He shows up on the scene. Haggai, chapter 1, the very first verse, it says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, and this for us would be June the 1st, or if they added another month, it'd be tomorrow, July the 1st. On the sixth month, the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, to deliver a clear and precise, strong message to the Israelites. The Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. See, I'm telling you. <laughs> there is a Joshua in there, so that, you know. The high priest saying, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, not just God, not just the one you think you've been worshiping and sacrificing to, the Lord of hosts. This is the sovereign Lord. This is the Lord of all, above all and in all. And if the Lord of hosts has a word for you, it's best to listen and listen intently. The Lord of hosts saying, this people, notice the first thing the Lord of hosts says to Haggai. This people, not my people. He didn't even call him his, his people. This people. There, there's, there's, no re, there's no real relationship between me and them anymore. There's a disconnect. They're not worshiping me like that. They're not being obedient to me. They're not, they're not sacrificing me as they should. They're, they're not following me. as they, they're not. This people. This group of people who have turned their back. This people says, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. It's not time to build the temple because there's a work stoppage. We have this certificate that's nailed to the wall right there on that, that stone right there that we can't build the temple. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I mean, think about it, people. Is, does this seem right to you? That you have nice houses and the temple is in ruins? What are you doing? What have you done? And I want us to focus on that last phrase right there. Consider your ways. God is speaking. God is speaking through Haggai, and he's saying... You're focusing all your attention and all your effort on yourself, on what you want, on what you can get, what you can accomplish, and you're neglecting God. You've forgotten what he's done for you. You're not doing what he's called you to do. He, he sent you here. He released you from captivity to rebuild the temple as a thank you. And you're not doing it. Consider your ways. Have we, have we ever had anybody say to us, do you, know, do you realize what you're doing? Do you have any idea what you're doing? Because, because they see something in what we're doing that 
We don't see. We've blinded ourselves to what's going on and all the, the, what, all the consequences, and we're just doing something. They're like, whoa, 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 you don't need to be doing that. Do you, do you see what you're doing? Do you realize what you're doing? You need to think about what you're doing. You know, does it seem right to you to do that? Is what you're doing, is that glorifying God in any way? Is that building his temple, his kingdom? Is, is that bringing him honor? Is that bringing him glory and praise in what you're doing? And, and it usually depends to us how we receive that. Uh, you know, who, who says it? If someone questions what we're doing, if someone questions us about the things that we're doing, if, if they don't know us, if we don't know them, then we pretty much consume in our minds that they, they, they don't know what they're talking about, and we just ignore them. But if someone that we really know and knows us really well comes to us and asks us questions, do you know what you're doing? Do you see what you're doing? I mean, if it's our spouse, if it's a really close friend, people that we work with that we've been friends with for years, and they bring it to our attention then we'll listen because they know us and maybe they got something to say. I mean, is, shouldn't, shouldn't, we have, shouldn't we all have people in our life that truly care so much about us that they can speak into our life Amen. and we can listen to them because they encourage us and they'll challenge us, but also they'll caution us and they'll question us and even correct us. So here, here in this chapter of Israel's history, God is using Haggai to speak rebuke and caution and correction to Israel because he cares about them and what they're doing. But basically what they're not doing. He continues in verse 6. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. I mean, this is the second time in three verses. It, almost back to back, consider your ways. We always know when it's repeated in there, it must be important. You, you, Israelites, you need to look at your life. You need to look what you're focusing. You're working hard, but you got nothing to show for it. And you need to look at our relationship between you and your God. You're just going through the motions. Consider your ways. And go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. That's what you're supposed to be doing, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because my house that is in ruins, whatever one of you runs to his own house. You've neglected me. You focused on yourself, and it's, it's, it's all about you. I, I told you to go, and you went, but you didn't, get, you didn't even bring enough wood back to build the temple. You didn't even have enough wood to complete it, so I stopped it. But you got your houses. And even earlier, it says paneled houses, and paneled houses are really nice. I mean, not today. You're going to see wall paneling. You want to tear it down. But, you know, back then, instead of just mud and stone, they had wood walls. So it was nice. See, but Israel had turned, they had turned from God and started focusing on themselves. They, they had exchanged the creator for his creation. Stuff. And, and instead of obeying God and rebuilding the temple to bring pleasure and glory to God... They've been busy accumulating things for their own pleasure, yet never being satisfied, planting crops but never having enough to gather at harvest time, never having enough food to eat, not, not enough to drink, never having enough clothes, and never, never not having enough money. Does that sound like people today? 
I mean, do we ever complain about not having enough? I wish I had, wish I had more of this. I wish I had more of that. Or have we become comfortable and content with the things of this world? You know, enjoying the life that we focused on and, and we've created for ourselves. But in the, in, the, in the meantime, gradually drifting away from God. Worshiping counterfeit gods. You know, the same gods or the same idols that the enemy worships. The lost worship that they place ahead of everything else. I mean, has, has, has our tendency, uh, the tendency of our sinful nature, has it convinced us to turn towards created things, making them idols? You know, putting our hope and trust in created things, not the creator of things. <laughs> now, we may not easily want to admit that some things have become idols in our life. But let me ask you this. How often does God take a back seat to things in our life? I mean, who or what do we turn to when we're hurting, when we're struggling, when we're depressed, when we need to feel accepted, when we need to feel loved and that somebody cares for us? That we need to be affirmed, patted on the back, recognized for something that we've done or something that we have. Now, I know that's kind of like a, as a cloud coming in. And, 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 I, and before we all start to feel like Eeyore, that nobody cares, uh, that we've really messed up in our life. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with... Obtaining accomplishments and, and receiving recognition and being successful and, and have possessions. There's nothing wrong with that. These things, as long as these things don't have us. Understand? As long as these things don't have us and control us. Here, here's what we all need to understand. God's not going to sit back and allow his children to be entrapped by things of this world without doing all he can to remind us of who he is. He's, he's not going to just sit back and just let things of the world entrap us without doing all he can to remind us of who he is and what he can do. He, he loves us too much to allow that. He loves us so much that he allowed his son to die for us so that we could have a relationship with God. If we believe in Jesus' death and resurrection, we'd receive salvation. That salvation is a rescue from things that entrap us, from the sin that keeps us from away from God, to bring us to God. He didn't stop at anything. He went as far as offering his son for us. So God will not stop at anything. He will do whatever it takes to rescue us. He'll do whatever it takes to bring us back into a right relationship with him. That's why Haggai says this in verse 10. Therefore, be, be, because, because of your selfish choices, Israel, because of your turning your back, your rebellion against God, you, you know the right thing you should have done, but you chose to do the opposite because you made those choices. I want to remind you who I am. Therefore, because of your choices, the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. I'm putting a work stoppage on it. I'm stopping what you've been gathering. I'm stopping what you've been accumulating. It stops. I know we don't like reading things like that in the Bible. We want to read the happy stuff. You know, the good stories and how this is done. And we don't like to read about God rebuking his people. We don't read, like to read about God disciplining and correcting. But this is, this is what he does to his children. He's correcting them because they're, they're busying themselves with temporary things. 
And the problem with temporary things is just that. It's temporary. It's not going to last. You're putting all your hope and everything in these things. They're going to turn to dust. Or are going to end up in somebody else's hands when you're gone. So sometimes we need to understand that God, God's going to do things. God's going to allow certain things to happen in our life. Not, not to punish us, but to remind us of who he is. Who he is. And we're not him. And he's going to do that to draw us back. To draw us back to him. And to see if we truly worship him or his creation. Let me ask you this. And it, and will we continue to worship God when life falls apart? You know, when... I mean, it's okay. It's fun to come to church and be with friends and everything and share about the great week and all, looking forward to the holiday and the July 4th and stuff like that. And it's fun to sing the songs that we know and stuff like that, and it just boosts our spirits and stuff like this. But will we continue to worship that way when our life falls apart? When the doctor says dot, dot, dot. When the diagnosis is dire. When we lose the job. When we fail. When he leaves. When she leaves. When someone dies. Will we continue to worship God when life falls apart? When it seems like there's been a work stoppage placed on our life and our emotions. And if we don't, if we don't continue to worship God, because we have to be in just a, if we have to be in, in a certain frame of mind, in a certain emotional state to worship God, then are we beginning to hear the words of Haggai in, in our mind? Consider your ways. Consider your ways. I mean, have we, ever, have we ever sensed God's still, small voice saying, what are you doing? What have you done? In, in the same way that he spoke to Adam and Eve, who brought sin to his creation, thinking they knew better than God. What have you done? Adam and Eve, consider your ways. Or, or when the Israelites were in the wilderness, and Moses would lead them through the wilderness, and Moses was up on Mount Sinai, have, getting a word from God, the Lord of hosts, the Ten Commandments, while the people of Israel were constructing a golden calf to worship. And when Moses comes back down, what are you doing? Consider your ways. What you've done. Or when we, when we open the Bible, we read in, in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus is speaking with his disciples. He's, he's instructing his disciples and he's instructing his followers. And basically when you're reading the New Testament and Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he's speaking to us. And he says this in verse 31. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Do you notice how much it sounds like Haggai? That you, you, you eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you don't have enough. You got clothes, but you're not warm enough. It sounds just like Haggai. This is in Matthew. It's like Jesus was quoting Haggai. And it, for, for after, basically, well, now that thought just came to me. <laughs> he probably told Haggai to tell him that. Yeah, that's how that works. So, and if it's repeated by God, then it must be important. For after all these things, the food and drink and clothes, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles, the lost, they focus on these things. They worship these things. These things have become idols to them. They have to have these things. They'll do everything they can without God to try to accomplish these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He's going to provide. He, he knows you need this. 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Consider your ways. Are you worried about food and drink and clothes? You should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. And it's not just one time that these things will be added. These things will be added daily because it's not just one time that we seek the kingdom of God. Seeking the kingdom of God is a daily journey. See, our life, our life is constantly in motion. We're, we're either always moving one small step toward God in, in our obedience, in, 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 our, in our worship, or we're moving one small step away from God by focusing on things that come between what God has called us to do and what we want to do. Or we become too focused on things that keep us from growing closer in our relationship with God. When we don't consider our ways, when we don't seek first the kingdom of God, are we telling God that we have forgotten our first love? Are we telling God that we've forgotten his commands? And, and his promises. Have we put our trust in created things? If so, how do we get back to God? How do we get back to a life that pleases and glorifies God? How did Israel, how did Israel get back to a right standing with God? After they turned his, their back, after he had re released them from captivity and gave them one job to do, and yet they turned away. How did they get back to a right relationship with God? The word is called repentance. Israel repented. They, repentance is confessing the sin, confessing the mistake. And then turning away from it, turning back to God. He's doing a 180. You're walking this way away from God one step at a time. You realize it and you turn around and come back one step. Hey God, chapter 1, verse 12. Then, after God's reminder of who he is to Israel... After three weeks of a drought, three weeks of a work stoppage, then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai because the Lord God had sent him so the people feared the Lord. They realized and remembered who God is, what God can do. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's new message to the people. I am with you. What comforting words. You've been away from God in captivity for seven year, 70 years. You've come back and still you've drifted away from God again for 16 more years, even in Israel. And yet God still says, I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. This is a promise from God that never ends. The Lord, the Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. The governor of Judah. He roused the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak. He roused the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they began work on the house of the Lord of armies, their God. Forget the work stoppage order. This is God's command. This is God's promise. We're worshiping God and God will lead us to do so many great things. Who cares what they think? We're going to do what God has called us to do. 
See, there was repentance in Israel from the top down. All of Israel repented. And because of their repentance, the Lord roused their spirit and they began to serve the Lord. They began to worship the Lord and began building the temple of their God. And like the Israelites, once we gain a holy fear of the Lord, once we've been reminded of who He is and what He's done for us through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, that causes us to repent and turn from our rebellion, from our sin, and stop putting things before God. Once we repent, the Lord will rouse His Spirit in us. He'll fan the flame of salvation in us. And He'll encourage us and give us the strength to be strong and courageous at all times. He will, he will help us to live a life of hope as His chosen child. And He will teach us how to be an example of Jesus to the world around us at all times. He did it with Israel. And he'll do it again with us. Because he made a promise. The same promise he made in Haggai, he made in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And he says, and be sure of this. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're worried about, no matter what you're afraid of, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Consider your ways. What God did through Haggai to rescue and restore Israel, what God did through his son Jesus to rescue and restore us, what God has done through Lake Community Church and the people of Lake community church, what we've been through, how he's answered prayers, how he's led us to here for, for, for 10 years, with, through all the cheers and the tears, and how he's preparing us for what's next. God's been rousing his spirit in his children throughout history. And he will continue to do it again and again and again. Do you believe that? Would you consider your ways? Let's pray. God, we thank you for so many things, so many blessings in our life. But right now, in this moment, we thank you for your promise that you are always with us and you will always be with us. What, what, what greater sense of assurance and, and comfort and peace do we need to, can, to live this life that you're with us so we can be strong and courageous, so we can have a hope as your child, that, that we can be an example of Jesus. You may be asking yourself, what do I, what do I need to do now? Consider your ways. Consider the life that you're living. And has God taken a back seat to anything, anything in your life? And if, he, if it has, if anything has taken, push God to a back seat. It's time to repent. You can't live your life that way and please God. If he's an afterthought, a rabbit's foot, someone you turn to when you're in trouble, only.
today. God, we ask you to help us consider our ways. Consider what we're doing, what we've done. And if we need to repent, to draw closer to you, help us with that promise that you're always with us and you'll always be with us to the end of the age. Because we can't wait to see what you're going to do next. God, we thank you and we praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.